How do patients with resistant pseudomonas infection differ from other patients? Are they more expensive? Do they do better? They do wor do worse? What? So I, I mean, I think that's our biggest challenge. Uh, they don't uh, they don't have a sign that tells us they have pseudomonas compared to some other resistant gram negative organism. If you look at risk factor studies or scoring systems, everything overlaps. And so it kind of gets back to this same concept that we've been talking about so far of understanding your local epidemiology, know your patient-specific microbiology history, what are they, surveillance cultures, those types of things, previous antibiotic exposures, because mm -hmm. that's gonna drive it, because they're completely overlapping risk factors. Pick your favorite drug or just an organism, they have the exact same risk factors. And not to, to put a grenade on the table, we have a fair number of leukopenic patients who come in with only the fairest wisp of hints that something's going on and they're not developing pus and they're not getting big infiltrates until their white count comes back and they need antibiotics. How do you do that? This is all a challenge, isn't it? But I do think there's something unique about pseudomonas. Uh, and I say that because we, we did a study where we looked at patients who had bacteremic pneumonia at Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And what we found was that the patients who had bacteremic pneumonia due to Enterobacteriaceae were more likely to get treated with an antibiotic that didn't cover the bug. Really? But the mortality was highest in those that had pseudomonal infection. And so there's something about the host-bug interaction in that setting that's really key. And it really makes me pay more attention to patients that I think are at risk for having a pseudomonal infection. I think that's where we started, which is not only is pseudomonas a nasty bug, but the patients who get it tend to be the most vulnerable. And so they're more likely to die all causes, and pseudomonas may be what ticks them over, but boy, it's a nasty combination. Well, but there's still a lot to achieve by adequate therapy of oh, the yeah. pseudomonas, because they are the ones who lose the most <laughs> right. from inadequate early therapy. Sure, most to gain, most to lose. That's Nobody right. is sitting back saying, oh, look at Mr. Jones. He's so old, he's so immunocompromised, he's so sick, leave him alone, let him die. No, that's the fun part, treating him, right? Making him better. But it's not just Mr. Jones. I mean, uh, without getting into specific details, we recently had a couple, they both had cystic fibrosis in our intensive care unit, and both had multi-drug resistant, in fact, it was extremely drug resistant pseudomonas that led to fatalities in both cases because we couldn't treat the organism. So it's not just older patients who really have nothing left. I mean, these are younger people who potentially have right. years or decades of life ahead of them. So we have to go on and discuss the treatment options that we've got, because nobody wants to let these people die if we can at all help it. So what's out there? What are the antibiotic classes? What are the agents we've got that are effective against resistant Pseudomonas aeruginosa? And why don't we just run through some of the advantages and the disadvantages? Right, you want to start us off? Sure, I, you know, I, I would have to go with our own experience and I'd have to say the carbapenems are really the backbone. And okay. we've gone to a situation now, and this is even true amongst our house staff, where you know, anyone who comes in with any type of a risk factor, we tend to go to a carbapenem. Now, in our institution, we have other agents that also may be effective, but the carbapenems seem to have the greatest overall activity, at least locally, and, and we become more of a carbapenem-driven hospital. And I'll let some of the other people yeah, comment I would, on other I agents. would uh, just kind of emphasize here that that will be institution specific. So okay. you need to know what you're looking at because we're actually the flip. Right. Um, in our institution, carbapenems of cefepime, piperacillin, tazobactam, and marrow, it's the less, least likely to be active against pseudomonas and pericline. It's just because of the complexity of resistance mechanisms in that yeah, But organism. I'm talking about in the ICU. Yeah, in yeah. our ICUs yeah, as about, well. We have the same thing. In our ICU, about 20% of our pseudomonas are carbapenem resistant. Uh, PIPTAS continues to have the highest activity, uh, and we don't actually have an ESBL problem in our institution. We're very fortunate thus far. And so when we do the game and the numbers, and we say, well, if I want to say, theoretically, I want to get to a 95% empiric hit rate for my gram negatives I might encounter, what do I need to start with? We generally start with piperacillin tazobactam plus an aminoglycoside. Uh, I was going to say, I was getting a sense that Am I hearing this right? You're using unitherapy against pseudomonas? Oh, well, there's a difference. There's unitherapy against pseudomonas when you know the pathogen and you know the susceptibilities, which I think we would all call the de-escalation phase or the definitive therapy phase, versus multi-drug therapy uh, as a pathway initially to ensure that the patient's getting at least one drug that's in vitro active against the culprit pathogen. And, 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 and that's, I think, an important paradigm and an important lesson, which is to realize what you start with ought not actually be what you finish with. Fair enough. But you know, I, I make my. I'm sorry, yeah, I just to, to kind of 
build on that a little bit too is that it's not just pseudomonas and Andy, Andy kind of suggested that before but like if you happen to have a lot of carbapenem resistant acinetobacter that's in your ICU that all has to go into that empiric therapy decision so you're looking at that cocktail that combination that gives you the most right. likely ability to get it up front. Now you see I anger all my ID colleagues maybe I, not anger but I, I make the money easy because when I see somebody that I really suspect has resistant pseudomonas I take the grenade I pull the pin and I throw everything I've got against the wall I'm perfectly happy to cone down later when we get the culture results. But our antibiogram is that these are bad bugs and we know often need two or three drugs. And the aminoglycosides are always part of it, no? Well, I, well I, you know, every patient and every infection is different. And I think that um, always being very aggressive, never being very aggressive, um, um, is probably not the way to go. You know, the, the patient tells you how aggressive you need to be. If the patient tells you, listen, look at me how sick I am, look at me how quickly I deteriorate. The patient tells you you only have one chance. And in those circumstances, you want to be very aggressive. If the patient tells you, listen, I may have a UTI, I may have a pneumonia or not, I'm relatively stable, I'm not that sick to begin with, maybe you take a different approach. Remember that with antibiotics, unlike any other medications, you know, if you use them and overuse them and use too many of them, uh, this will affect the, your ability to, to treat future patients. So you have to, you have to balance those. So when we talk about antibiograms, when we talk about personalizing risk factors, I think it's important to, to take. So I think that that's, so that's the infectious disease doctor's approach. You know, very often you say, you know, I want to do everything because my prospective patient is everything I have on my table right now. And that's an okay approach as well. But I think that you have to. Also, I, 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 you know, we talk about antibiograms as guidance for uh, treatment, but you know, hospitals that have a lot of those ESBL-producing enteric bacteria use, by definition, a lot of carbapenems. Hospitals that use a lot of carbapenems push their pseudomonases to become resistant. Hospitals that have less of those may have more susceptible pseudomonases. So the antibiogram gives you some guidance. Just knowing the type of infections that mm -hmm. you treat in your ICU will give you another... You know,